All right, welcome to today, student stories. Today we have Garrett here. He has a blog about Hidden Holland, which is very interesting, and he will tell us a little bit more about his journey with automations. Let's get started. If you can share a little bit more about your background on how you got started with automation, that would be awesome. Big question to start with. So my background is actually my background is in e-commerce. Um, and I was running uh, web shops across Europe selling uh, uh, international uh, food products. And the stores grew and they grew beyond what I could handle. And it was super difficult to find qualified staff to help me. And that is actually how I got almost forced into automation because I needed to do stuff that was just impossible to do by myself or with the people that I had available in my team. And I also, there were too many mistakes. And if you're dealing with physical products, that is very costly. So sending the wrong product to the wrong person or sending the wrong, um, the, the quantity was not right and getting complaints about that, just a return would cost us over 25 euros, which is like, $30 or 20 pounds. So it's, it was expensive. So that was where the need for automation came in. I didn't, I already was introduced to the former name of make, which was Integromat. And I had some very simple automations that I thought were just very cool and already a little helpful from the main like library that make offers on their website. Um, but it was very limited, but also for $9 a month, I thought, you know, I already get my money's worth, but then I, also knew there was more potential and I had all these issues. So that's where I went to YouTube and put all my problems into YouTube and YouTube came back with many solutions in many um, uh, different channels. And that's how I started to do more and more with make, but, and up to this day, I have to honestly admit, but we will get, I'm sure to that later. Uh, always when you reach a certain level, there's a new level to discover. And it very quickly was not enough anymore on YouTube. And there were two, I think, YouTube channels that I was following the most at that time. You were, were one of them. And then I discovered your course and I thought, okay, he sounds the most reliable. He knows the most, I think. So let's, let's try it. And that's how I came into your world and still am. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. So let's go back to the very beginning. If you can still remember, what was the mm -hmm. first automation project you worked on and what did you learn from it? So the very first automation I was working on um, seriously was um, a project for e-commerce to get data in different places automatically. So for example, one thing we were doing, we were using different shipping companies to ship parcels to depending on the destination and the package size. So sometimes it could be UPS and the other it could be DHL or whatever company it was. And we were creating, so every morning we would check manually all the orders we got in in five different stores. We would log in, go to orders, get the list uh, waiting to be processed. And we would copy and paste the order numbers into the columns in an Excel sheet or a Google sheet, uh, which carrier they were going to be sent with. So later on, we could scratch them off and make sure that the piles had the correct numbers of parcels. So we didn't mix something up. That was something we were spending time in. Um, and that was, I think, the first serious one I tackled um with also in the in a community help um to actually have woocommerce send the data the e-commerce e-commerce platform we're using uh or what well, we were using and sending the data to make um processing the criteria what de decided which company they were going with and then put it into a google sheet and i first tried to do it myself and it was a super messy google sheet because it kept creating a new row so there would be empty spaces between each carrier. And then I remember very vividly that um, you helped creating a solution for making them come together. Um, so it all looked very nice, like a, a person did it. And that already saved us well, close to half an hour each day, each working day. And that was oh, the first wow. one. And I was hooked when I got that one. Yeah. So it's like two and a half hours a week. And then you have like 10 hours uh, about. 10 hours each month. If you think you about it, it's insane. So 120 yeah. hours a year. That's insane. And that, yeah. 
And that automation could easily run within the $9 budget, within the 10,000 yeah. operation a month. So I didn't even need to have like an expensive plan for doing it. It was just, and then it was also for me the big realization that actually May could be an employee and a very inexpensive one. Mm. So that also made it easier for me to decide to spend money and also later on to really increase my, my operations uh, because it, I did not see it as a cost anymore. I saw it as a very cheap hourly rate. That's yeah. a great so that way was the of, first one. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's a great way of looking at it. That automation is actually like an employee that you have that helps you an assistant and not so much like an operational expense because it really is a lot more than that. Um, it okay. really, it really is. And we, and we really um, forget sometimes to calculate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not only fun projects. Of course, it's nice also have your weather report on your Slack channel in the morning. You know, that's all nice. But uh, there's also really stuff that saves you a lot of time and money. That's true. So, yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about your journey. Can you share us one skill or trick that you've learned in Make that you didn't know when you started and how it has helped you in your projects? This is the most difficult question because there are so many. But I think the main thing that really made a big difference in all of my operation thinking was learning functions, honestly. Like the potential there is enormous um, to change data in a way that you can actually use it. So um, yeah, I think all of the uh, automations that are actually time savers now have so many functions and I use a lot of those. And it's still difficult, you need to keep using them uh, my trick, by the way, if I can give the, a little trick, is that I save each and every one in a database. Like I use Notion for that, but I, because I forget it. Like a year later, I think, oh, I did something with it. I don't exactly know how, and then I can very easily find it. Um, yeah, it's the biggest, uh, biggest change. Um, yep. That's very powerful. Um, by the way, we have a make functions cheat sheet, which you can download below in the description if you want to see it, um, where you can learn more about these functions. Okay, can you share a time when you didn't know how to continue developing a scenario where you got really stuck and how did you handle it? That's an easy question. I get stuck about every week. Um, <laughs> building a new one. And that is not because Make is a bad platform or the knowledge is not correct. It is just because you keep pushing your own boundaries. Um, and the, my main issue personally, and it's different for everybody, is you also need, besides understanding the technical side of things, you also need to get the logic and you also need to be able to step above everything you're doing and look at it from a helicopter view and think, okay, this is actually the outcome that I need. So don't get very stuck in how you're doing it now and trying to get the robot to do exactly what you're doing right now because a robot is not a human. They cannot think and you can put AI in it right now, but still it cannot think. So the more you can approach it from a robot perspective, and that's basically that you make those decision trees very easy, go left or right, go left or right, um, it, you get better automations and you get less frustration that the next time he does something again, and you thought, oh, I did not think about that exception. So that, I think that's a major headache, the, the exceptions in everything. It sounds all great on paper and then you're building and then you're thinking about everything that could go different like somebody doesn't fill uppercase or they leave something empty or whatever it is. Um, and, and then you get stuck. How do I deal with that? Um, without sounding like a big advertisement, your community is my lifesaver. It honestly is because people are using this for different ways and getting the feet, just putting your issue in. There's always somebody who dealt with it and and I also notice that myself now, now I'm at this level that I can also now help certain queries from others, but not all, but certain. And, and I always are able to continue to go forward. So um, yeah, that is my way of dealing with it. And of course, ChatGPT nowadays can also be really helpful with that, especially if you're looking for, for example, I like using Airtable. Uh, in Make, everything works super easy, but Airtable is a little difficult with, with formulas, for example. And the help files are not that easy to read if you're not familiar with it or you're a beginner. But then if you put it in ChatGPT, ChatGPT can literally 99% of cases create this formula for you and then you're done in like 10 seconds. So, and you can continue. 
That is powerful. Yes, we are using ChatGPT a lot of times as well. And it really made it a lot easier for all kinds of different things. Also, when working with APIs, you can simply ask it questions about, hey, how I do how do I you do this with this API? Entering helpful. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. So how do you approach the decision of what to automate and what not to automate? Because people tend to try to automate everything, but we really have to be careful with this. Otherwise, we will be stuck in automating everything or trying to automate everything, but it will, will not be really used more time. So it's a very good question. So I'm lo looking forward to how you approach this, this. I think it's a very good question too. And it's so true, especially in the beginning when you're enthusiastic. What I find, what I'm finding personally with Make is that actually it takes a lot of time setting an, up, an automation up. If you actually want to have a useful automation that can really help you save time, it takes a lot of time to get it right. Just uh, putting, it looks super simple, click module, 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 done. No, because it's what you put inside those modules that makes a difference. And that's where it becomes really advanced with the functions. And um, especially if you got a nest functions and functions, you can do more and more, but it's also very easy then to break. And then if it breaks, you don't really know. So you need to put first, that's something I learned from you is to, to first do the first step if you got a nest and make sure that it works. And then you do one nesting, one level up, you test it again and you continue until you get to the end. But just doing that process is super time consuming. It can take an hour, it can take two hours. So um, that's why you need to think what you're going to automate because if it is something just fun, but it's only costing you 30 seconds to do once a month, it's gonna be a very long time to earn that money back, but you invested in setting your automation up. And if you have something that costs you like the, my first example, two and a half hours a week, you can spend a week building it and it costing you 40 hours but then already in a few months you're earning it back um, and when you get more proficient it doesn't cost you 40 hours it will take you like eight hours and then you earn it back within within literally a month so you really have to think about the time saving you really have to think about okay what am i doing how much time can i save with this and that's a decision um for me one of them the other one is how many exceptions to the rule are there? The more that it is always the same process, the easier it is to automate, the more complicated it is, the more human intervention is needed. The e For example, I'm also now transitioning my business from e-commerce to what you're introducing me with a blog due to health issues for one. And one of the thing now is my automation of course was first very centered on e-commerce and now they're very centered on WordPress, content creation. I'm finding, although ChatGPT is amazing, that writing content, it can only help you so much if, for me, it's mostly idea generation and making sure I cover all the topics I need to cover. But actually the writing, I have a very specific voice. I have a very specific, I'm very outspoken. I have things to say. So I would like to say that myself. So trying to automate that, I found was a really big waste of time. So I took like, uh, 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 helicopter view I went a little higher up and think and looking downwards and think okay what if I don't want to automate the writing but what else do I do and then I came into editing and moving material from um, my notepad to Airtable or from Airtable into WordPress and editing photos and there is so many opportunity to automate or outsource not everything also I think is very important I think uh, and entrepreneurs to be honest very too quickly nowadays look at outsourcing because we hear, hear so much about it. And I think VAs are amazing, but we shouldn't give them super stupid work because they can do it for a small amount of money. There are people too, they like nice and enjoyable work as well. And they also have brains and you can utilize them much better if you give them interesting work. It's nice for them, it's nice for you. And that's where humans collaborate so well. So really the stupid work, quotation marks, if you can automate that, that's helpful for everybody. It saves you money, it saves you time, and it also makes keeps work fun. And then utilize VAs for the human part of your business. Uh, I would say, long answer short, if there is decision-making involved, it is very difficult to automate. If it is something you're doing on a process, you can write, with, uh, you can write it down in SOP and it's one, two, three, four, five, you probably a very good candidate to automate. So if it saves you time and if it's repeatable, automate. Um, that's sorry, it. long answer. Is it a good answer? Yeah, that's a great conclusion. Yeah. Okay. That's All how right. I look at it, at least. 
Yeah, so you're basically searching for your zone of genius of what you definitely want to keep doing. And then you're looking at a higher level to do, check, okay, what else is there? And then you can maybe check what is the most time consuming thing, but that's still repetitive. Um, and which is like um, a process or which can be put into a process. And then you start there with the automation. Would that yeah, summarize then I take it your one approach? Step, yeah, I take it one step further. So if I, it's because it's super easy to qualify the uh, instantly automatable and human. But if I, I put it in the human bracket, I would still then um, have another look at it to see if, if there's still part of it that I would be able to automate. So I only distill um, I'm not going to say, okay, this is, needs a human needs to do that because there could be still step one to four that uh, a robot can do. And then step five, six, seven is left for a human. But if I take step one to four out, it can still be a time saver. So I, I, I take it, I, I rinse it through a few times, if that makes sense. Totally. Yes. That's yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. What resources like books, courses, communities, et cetera, have been most helpful in your automation journey? Um, well, YouTube in the beginning, absolutely. And I really enjoyed looking at different YouTube channels from different people just for getting a sense of, because uh, I think everybody has their own zone of genius. Um, so, uh, and you also have um, different, in, for example, some have very complicated videos. And that's very difficult if you're just starting out. So then it's great to start with the simple ones. But once you get to the simple ones, move to the uh, advanced ones. Uh, that's, I think, also how I got to you um, because I start to figure out like, hey, your videos are a little bit different. They go a little bit further. Um, so for now, my main resource, I don't like, I tried the free Facebook group from Make. I really tried. It's not for me. Um, same thing with the own community Make creates. I know this is not maybe great for them to hear. I find it difficult because what I find with free communities, it's there's no barrier to, to ask. So what I find there is very much people just taking and some people always try to help and it's always the same people answering and the same people asking and I don't like that. So for me, it's really your membership, your course. And I again, I don't want to sell like an ad, but because we're all invested in it, we paid for it, we are continuing to pay for it. It's a different group of people and, uh, and you're with each other in a journey. So you start to get to know each other. I know quite a few people really well, like what do they do in life and who are their partners and do they have kids and are they busy? And, and that helps because then they come up and say, you know, I don't know how to deal with this issue. I am so overwhelmed and uh, I'm stuck. And it's so much nicer to then help and also get help back when you need it because it goes both ways. So for me, it is a paid membership and I really am very happy with the one I'm in. And that happens to be yours. Um, but that would be my advice when you're really serious with it, invest your money in it because it's really different than a free community. I don't like, I, honestly, I, people seriously, he did not make me say this. But it's really my own opinion. I hate free Facebook groups in general. So um, I don't have any books. I've never read a book about make automation anything. I don't even know it exists. Um, I would be very interesting to know if there are any. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but no, it's really the ability to have this um, this um, um, safety net of a community to go back to that I'm a member of. And I use it very often. Thank you. All right. Yeah, you you are also a student. Like you have gone through our Make Simplified Accelerator course. And how has that contributed to your success in automation? Oh, my goodness. Everything. It made every single difference. Without it, you can only learn so much from the help files. And again, it, it goes back to there is the technique part. And yes, if you really dig in, you can learn it, but the problems only start arising when you start applying it in your own use case. And it's never the same as how it is written out in the use case. So even though all the possibilities are there, if you don't know the possibility is there, you will not look for the, do you know what I mean? Like if, if you don't know a module exists, you will not look up the help file for that module in, because you have not found it. So I think that's where community and course is super important because in the course you get homework so it's very much like looking at tv at the cooking channel and you think oh it actually looks like very doable i can make that piece of meat or that vegetable but then you start doing it and it's a complete mess in your kitchen it's very much the same with building the automation i found every time when i looked at a youtube video i thought i can do this but then i had this one little thing that was different in my use case and i need to add in a little function or an extra module 
I was not aware of it. I got stuck. And that is really where like the homework and get into assignments and really play with it and think, oh, I actually don't know it as well as I thought. I knew arrays and aggregators and iterators, and it's actually still bringing up issues sometimes because it gets super complicated. Um, and then also uh, having the community for use case. And the more use cases you see, for example, I love in your community, you get an email when somebody puts something up and I put it into a different folder because for me, that is also just as many as much as a lesson as, uh, as, as, the, as the regular lessons are. Because then I see other people bumping. It's also nice to see other people getting into roadblocks because you feel not completely stupid yourself. Um, but uh, no, that's how you learn. You learn by doing. And that's in, that was impossible before uh, the course. So the course was good because you go also much deeper than all the free stuff that's out there. Because if you look at the scenarios that make offers, for example, ready made for you, they're always like two modules or three. It, they can really help certain things. They're, they're amazing, but they are not the ones that are going to replace a full-time employee. Um, and, and for that, you really need to dig deeper. And that takes learning. And being in a course really helps with that. So all right. answers are kind of long, but I have a lot of things to say about this. That's all good. We have all time in the world. Uh, not all, but okay. we have automated so much. So we got the time right now to talk about it. I know, because I'm doing this now for four years already. So it's also quite a long time. Wow. Four years already. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Nice. Quick. All right, we already talked about the very simple or the very beginnings. Um, now let's get into some more complicated stuff. What is the most complicated automation logic or design that you have ever created? And what is your process or method to create it? Oh, um, the most complex, the two things that I, fi I find the most complicated, because it's also personal, um, is error handling. So that's where I got a few complex ones, especially if I have an idea for error handling and then want to send it back up into the automation. So it tries again after certain other things it did, like maybe adjust something or look for another field. Instead, if one field is not working, maybe another one will. Uh, I find that becoming qu uh, complicated super quickly and my brain is not wired that logical that I get lost very quickly myself. So I always find that super complicated. But once it's done, it can really help bringing it out like you having to dive in immediately yourself again. It's super nice that you can build stuff even if the first try doesn't go, the next one does, etc. cetera. Um, what I also find complicated is not so much in the number of modules or the way they're set up, but setting up AI correctly. So you get actually the output that you need. You really have to think about your prompting. Um, but again, once you get that, it can really make things so much easier because you get some thinking power in your automations. Um, and I keep being inspired. I was at a make uh, event um, this year with you, I met you there. Um, and it was one presentation where they did something where there was human intervention. You was able to say yes or no in a Slack message. And I thought, oh, wow, that opens up a whole new world where I was too afraid for AI in automation because I wasn't sure what it was going to do. But now I can still interfere without having to do all the steps before. So I thought that was amazing. Um, and again, functions, for, especially for e-commerce, I had some pretty complicated like, for example, setting my profit margin and the pricing. Sounds easy for a human, but there's a percentage and there's text and there is cost for the payment provider. There is um, um, a currency that can change and I want to have nice prices. So I didn't want to have like a euro price and then suddenly in pounds, it would look like something 25.12. So to round it and then for different countries, there are different rounding um, best practices. Some countries do 95, some do 99, some do 98. So I also wanted to make it look local. So it became a little complicated, but when I achieved it, it saved so much time. And it's functions, that all functions, nested function, function, function. So it does the math, and then it just it like distracts like two cents and all of that. <laughs> that's, that's a nice um, case. And, and how did that help you? Again, a time savers. If I had to put somebody on there to put my pricing in, and, and take a calculator out and type it all in, That's that time goes very quick. And no matter how cheap you can hire, it still gets expensive. Um, and you don't always want to hire cheap. So, um, and make never gets sick. It always works around the clock. I have some scenarios that I really need to have happen in the middle of the night. I'm super happy. 
I actually did wake up before at 5 a.m. to do stuff because my site was not as busy, so I could take it off, for example, for maintenance. And now I can some of those things. I can have make do while I'm just sound to sleep. Um, but yeah, it really helps. Wow. And what was your process or method to create this kind of scenario? For example, the one with the rounding, that's a very interesting use case. How did you start doing this or how did you create it? I think uh, very much what I mentioned earlier, um, I have to admit, I can go very quick and I just try to build it in one go. And then usually I'm very sorry. And the best method is really to do it step by step. Put the set variable thing, modules in there, make sure that you get the outcome you're expecting and then add the next layer or the next step. Community really helps to really put out like, hey guys, I get really stuck here. And then you get input from there. And yeah, also our uh, calls really help because sometimes even after the advice, and thinking it still doesn't work. And then it's super nice. I'm able to bring it into a live call and say, hey, this is what I've built. Can you please look at it? Because it doesn't do what, I'm ex what I expected it to do. So that all together is my process of doing it. I'm not really into, I know some people map or mind map. I notice that my brain's going too quick to sit down for that. And I also have issues with the mind mapping software. I find it so cumbersome and difficult. I don't do it actually. Sometimes I draw it on a piece of paper, but usually I can have the, flow in my head so i don't really do that um but what i did do in the beginning i started to put everything in the actual module and i really start started moving away over time to first doing the set variable uh, to test everything and that was something i learned for example in the course that was something i never thought about and in the course I also learned about tools where i could instead of having to send a webhook from the original sender every time uh, or forward an email again and again and again to test stuff, to use things like uh, where I could input my, because in uh, in in make it's that's technical, but every output is in JSON. So you have that little piece of uh, output and you copy there, there's tools you can copy that into and then it sends it to the, and you can say, okay, this is the webhook address and this is the uh, little code. And then you can click send, send, send as much as you want to. And you can continue to test without Gmail getting angry at you sending so many emails or um, um, having to delete test orders or anything because you keep making them. So that was another big um, um, uh, jump in, in learning. And that I got from the course, those, those things, those um, tools. Nice. That's a, a great method of like, I, I understand it. I totally get that you're not building out these mind maps because I'm also a very kind of visual person um, who already has this idea of the process in mind. And since make is so visual, it is kind of like a mind map. Yeah. And that's why right. we usually or I usually just go in and build it right away. But of course, like if you're working with clients or if we have bigger processes to look at, then we still create these kind of mind maps and processes first. So everyone is on the same page and understands what we actually try to achieve before we actually develop it inside Make. Yeah, and I, I kind of think also I have to cycle back to that opinion because uh, I think also the level where I'm at right now and the, and the future products for automation, they become bigger. And I think, uh, I think that's now uh, one of my frustrations that I... Can I get a work in the session time I have available? And then I kind of get lost next time I dive in. So I think it would also be very helpful for me to have it either on paper or digital, but things that I can put across like, okay, I built this one and I'm going to do this, but I see the bigger picture. Um, so you kind of have a, a manual to build. All right, let's get into some, uh, into another topic of productivity. Have you share, uh, can you share one example of a process that you automated that had a significant impact on your own productivity or the productivity of your team? Oh, I do so many. I do so many. Um, the main things for pr productivity are automations based around email. So um, we get lots of email that we need to look at, but they're not like, it's not like, Manuel sends me an email and I need to respond to him or the other way around. It's a newsletter. It's a invoice. It's all of those things. You kind of need to look at them, but they are not, um, they're not like uh, two way street communications. And that's where automations can help so much and where they do help me. So filing uh, attachments automatically. I know it's super basic, but if you get a lot of attachments like invoices, PDFs, they are super, super helpful. Um, distilling like you get a reminder for something and make sure i am a person 
maybe the only in the world by now that is only in his email box once a day. I hate my email. I only open it when I when my alarm goes off for it. I don't look at it at any other moment. But sometimes there are urgent emails that and people think, why are you not responding? Because everybody checks their email every five minutes. Well, I don't. So those type of emails I try to catch with filters or automations and then send it, for example, to Slack and I get a pop up there. We, and that way you get my attention. So if there's something like reminder in there or today, then uh, and things like that. So uh, that's a huge time save because that gives me the security. I don't need to be in my email all the time. And that saves me a lot of time not being in there. Um, um, another one, um, like the automation, like I described is far in the beginning, like creating uh, copy and pasting information into different documents. That's a huge help. And I do that a lot. Um, um, and um, I also have automations, for example, now with my content building, where I can I can I put some data in Airtable and then I click a button and it automatically formats my blog pay, uh, post uh, where I want to put an advertisement in or a sign up form or all of those things. It creates all the blocks. So then I just need to, and that's, I still have not found automation to copy and paste the text. I might get there in the future. But for now, that's why I would probably ask a VA to help me in the future. But um, yeah, uh, so that's a time saver. And I, uh, it's difficult to, every every automation at the end of the day is a time saver. I think one great one, I think new with every technique that we have available right now with the new AIs um, is a podcast. Uh, I, I, I love to learn and I listen to many podcasts and you, I'd like to a little bit less look at YouTube. But I hate the fact that I need to sit in front of a screen. I cannot do anything else. Podcasts, I find a little bit nicer because I can be on my bike and still listen. But I got so many, I cannot go through all of them. Like I like niche pursuits. They're an hour long um, and they're too long. And I have a few more. I can only, I need to choose. So I need, I now have an automation where it, um, and sorry if I look up because that's, I'm thinking that way. But um, it's an RSS, new podcast episode comes in. Um, the um, uh, automation, get the MP3 file um, from the RSS. It can now um, transcribe that automatically with something like Whisper. And that file, that uh, transcription file can then be put to a uh, chat GPT module, an open AI module, and it can then summarize it for you and create like executive summary and bullet points. And that then is delivered to email or Slack, or I think I got mine delivered in email. Actually, I put them in a Google Doc, and the Google the Google Doc gets sent to me once a day. Uh, and I got if there's more than one, I get them all together. And then I decide actually from that because usually typically leave something out. There's always information in the podcast more than what you get out of the summary. But it's for me a decision uh, a point where I'm like, okay, that one sounds interesting. That one doesn't. That one is for me. And then I put those to my playlist and those are the ones I listen to. So I am more um, picky about what I listen to. So I still listen, but ChatGPT helps me speak that all up and not listen to the wrong episodes. That's an example. That's a very yeah. great use case, like automatically letting podcast episodes summarized to you so you can decide yeah. which one to listen to. It's probably the right? same with newsletters. Like you can summarize each newsletter that you're getting, at least the ones that you're usually interested in, and then getting once a day, getting a digest email that contains all the relevant information that you want to get out for this day. So like creating your own kind of little digest. I think that's a very big uh, productivity toolkit as well. And that's the one that I want to build. In a lot of different cases. Yeah, yeah. the master I digest. Used to... What I do now with uh, email, for example, newsletters is uh, I have a lot of email, especially commercial ones, where I'm on the list for certain products or certain services. Um, and, and what I do now is just have it look for those keywords. And if the keywords are not in the email, it can automatically go to delete. And if it is that product that I'm looking for or the service I'm looking for, but there's also lots of newsletters that have something to learn. And those I, for now, just uh, save. And that's an issue. So actually what you just said is one on my list for next automations. That sounds amazing to have a daily digest of all of them. And just know if there's something in there that is actually interesting, because even on the ones you're learning from, sometimes they're promoting or they are uh, on a topic that is not of your interest. And you can just, uh, yeah, win time. 
But oh my God, I, this, you can keep me talking for another two hours. I have a few hundred uh, automations and all of them save me some time. So we can go over it. <laughs> but I think these are a few uh, pretty good examples. Yeah, that's like the main purpose that we are trying to achieve, saving time so we can focus on other things that truly matter. And not only saving time, but also saving on errors because automation also helps yeah. with uh, these kind yes. of things a lot. Oh my goodness. With the example from the beginning, it was not only the two and a half hours, but we also had a second automation where we could, with the help of Make, so you had plugins and platforms where you can scan the products and then saying you do the, have the right ones or the right quantity. And those are expensive. They, they started like a hundred dollars a month. And, and with the help of Make, and uh, a third party um, uh, uh, um, app on my phone that was, I think, nine, that was $16 a month. Uh, and then make did the rest. I was able to do that whole um, 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 check uh, auto automatic and get like feedback from it. And that brought our, so we had about on average two packages that went wrong each week. And they, there was an average cost of about 25 euros for each of them. That was 50 euros a month, uh, a week, 200 euros a month that we would lose just because of human error. And after the automation, we had about once every quarter. Nice. So speaking about money, there was also about over 500 euros in savings just to automate that. And then, yeah, I had to pay 45 euros in some operations for make. So let's say that the cost was 50 euros for that quarters. For the quarter, it's still 100 saved. And you can hire as much as you want. You can never take that error out if you work with humans. And because uh, that's where robots excel yeah, that's um, right. and humans don't. Uh, so uh, we need to play to our strengths, right? <laughs> and that's okay. like your, what, you, your, what you mentioned in the beginning. Like people try to automate everything. That is the big mistake you can make to think a robot can replace humans because they cannot. We need to really think about what is robot. Um, strength what is human strength if you really make that if you really think about that you could get much more out of it yeah okay sorry that's right thank you very much um you mentioned that you love functions what is the most complex function statement or combination that you've used in your automations <laughs> actually one that i just implemented this week and it looks now so simple but it had to do with um join and um um, 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 split um, because then you start to um, manipulate arrays and arrays by themselves are already quite complicated and then when you start to manipulate them you add another level of complexity well actually you're not you're simplifying but with everything that looks simple usually is very difficult uh, and that's also with this so just the understanding of it what does it actually do and same thing with get map that still confuses me all the time map is a function and get is a function and i if you would now say after four years can you tell me exactly how that works i cannot answer you i still have to go back to my own uh, use cases and see what how they're operating and i need to go back to the lesson and watch that's in from my brain uh, far beyond my uh, my my level um but when you implement them that you can do stuff that you thought was not possible with automations. So really get stuff out and, and process it um, later on, which, for example, I had that with tracking numbers. They were nested in, in so many different ways and they were dynamic. So they could be in spot number three or spot number 15. So uh, yeah, if you get the hang of that, then uh, to look for a key and whatever it is, and then use whatever the... Um, the answer is in there. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, the end, was that too broad of an answer? No, that's fine. Thank you. It's it's it, Functions is difficult, but they are also super powerful and they can save you a tremendous amount of operations. Oh, replace. If I only say the word, he probably starts laughing. Oh, I think I hijacked half of the last year's Q&A sessions with it. I couldn't get it, but once I got it, extremely powerful. Yeah, the replace function also with, works with RecX, <gasps> one of my second laughs. So it's very powerful if you understand how, first, how RecX works, and second, how a replace function works, because then you can manipulate text in any kind of way and extract any kind of information from any text, and that's very powerful. 
So if by now you haven't downloaded the Make Functions Cheat Sheet yet, go check <laughs> below it. the video. There is our Make Functions Cheat Sheet and it will help you a lot with understanding the functions. It has examples for everything and tells you how to implement them. So powerful functions are really powerful. And I also would like to say they're powerful, but don't get scared of them because Make makes it also easy to not use them. So for example, with the regex and the replace, you can also use the text parser module and that is way more intuitive much easier and when i get stuck on it i always implement the text parser module and then call it a day because it functions it works my automation is great but it's an extra operation so once and if you, your uh, scenario only runs once a month don't even bother but if you have it runs every five minutes then it really really brings you a benefit if you learn it because you can take the, the module out and you can put it into the function which is free uh, and um, so that was for me a big, um, big next step that I took in my automation. That's a very good transition into our next question. Like, how do you ensure the automation you implement is efficient and error free? So efficient not always means saving operations. No, although of course that is a big part of efficiency, but it's most efficient if you know it always runs because the cost is pretty high if it doesn't. I actually made a mistake not too long ago with Regex and for six days, mate, it didn't run as it should have run. And now I cannot go back into the, I do have the individual runs as a lock, but I cannot get to the data in bulk anymore. So I now need to go, I need to copy and paste one, each one of them and run it again. And that is super time consuming. So you can better have a few extra operations, but have it check for those errors and identify those errors and inform you about the errors quicker than six days, like in my case, um, then actually deal with the issue. So how do I deal with it? I'm still learning. Like you can also hear, I'm not gonna say I'm perfect. After four years, not even close. I'm still very much in the process of this because you just keep learning. But of course, error handlers can be important, but also complicated and difficult. Uh, I, I still struggle. Um, I think what I mentioned earlier, that behind the error handler to bring another path in to try something again. Um, but most of all, testing, 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 testing is the most important. If you are in a hurry and you put it live, hmm, um, you will be usually sorry after a little bit of time. So um, make it efficient. Yeah, make sure it's uh, um, error free, uh, um, but and also don't make it so complicated, especially in the beginning. Keep your automation simple. Is what my advice would be. You can always do go back to it in a few months when you know more, and do something else. That's actually what I do with all my automation right now. I'm actually in the process right now of going back to the very first ones, and see. Okay, this is with the knowledge then, and this is what I know now. What can I do with it? That's that's a very good approach. Like uh, just doing it and then reviewing what you did before. If you're getting to like you have a different knowledge set right now, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Maybe two cents I can add here regarding error free. Um, you can't predict every single error that might happen in the future. So what no. we usually do is we build it out, and then if there's anything obvious where we can already predict that this could have an error, then we build an error handler for this or build like a condition, a router to notify us if there's something wrong. For example, if a regex pattern could not be found where it always should be found, then we have a router afterwards to um, check if there was actually something found. If yes, continue. If not, it immediately um, notify us via email or another source like Slack or something that there's something off and then you can go in and fix it. Um, but then... Yeah we rather go in over time and ever receive an error, we look at this error and see, okay, is this like a one, once in a lifetime error or is it something that could be repeated? And if it can be repeated, then we build a solution for this to handle this error automatically. But you can't predict everything. So I already no. saw people that add like an error handler to every single module, but I think that's super inefficient and you should not do this um, and rather like... <laughs> and rather build it out like after you're facing actual errors. It's also very much experience. So you kind of get a feeling which modules give you the most headache and it's usually Airtable um, because Airtable is very strict in the data they expect. So if there's anything off, um, so I have a few tips there. Uh, one of, oh, if, you, if you're using Airtable, always set the setting, even if you think you don't need it to the smart 
uh, I don't know exactly the naming of it, but it's something at the bottom of the settings, like smart scenarios, smart um, rules, or I don't know what it is, but click it to yes, because that means, for example, with multi-select and select fields, if you don't have the option already in your air table and something new gets, something new gets added, then it gives you an error because it does not recognize the option. But when, once you select the, the, the smart, then um, it creates the new option for you. So then you don't get the error. So that was for me a big one to, that saved a lot of errors. The other one with Airtable that always take the extra little time to do when I fill in the f individual fields. Like for example, there's always a field with like a name. But let's say for one reason or the other, the name field is empty, which is normally never is. You could build the error handler, yes. You can also put something like um, uh, a function and put null in there. So it still does everything because for me, I will see it instantly when I go into my air table. So I don't need a whole error handler for that because it always never happens. But just adding the little uh, option for null, at least I know this scenario is not going to stop. It will just accept it as an empty value and, and continues. So those are things you can really do. It's a little bit of extra time in your building. It saves you a lot of headache in the in the future. And then monitoring, like the error message, like Manuel, it's a great advice. Like uh, make sure you see when there's an uh, when something happens, because that's also a, 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 a mistake you can make. I think with error handling to make it look like everything is green when something actually isn't. And that's actually what happened in my case with the six days. I didn't get a email from Make saying, hey, there's a problem with this scenario. It just ran until somebody who uses the data told me she was not able to look at it for a week and she went in and she's like, hey, I'm getting every day an email with just a dot in it. I think something is wrong. Yeah, that was a little bit late to find out. Um, so uh, be also careful with that. Uh, make sure that you actually get error messages. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I saw a lot of people also just simply adding an ignore error handler at the end of my yeah. and I was like, it's that's a dangerous probably, one. It, yeah, that's really dangerous because it just marks it as success and ignores any kind of error. And then you will never know that this error actually happened. No. And no. it just looks good because everything is green then and you will never have an error message, but that's not the purpose of until, yeah. Error hand, until, yeah, yeah. Until you find yeah. out that there are just dots in an email. No, but you did not use the ignore error handler. I did not want to say that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um. Can you share a success story where your automation skills led to a significant achievement in your career or a business? Hmm. Um. So because I'm a little bit different in my use case in the sense I'm not a consultant, is that it's not actually building my career or anything, but it did save me as a entrepreneur, as a business owner, um, step, and that allowed me to grow. So I think that's also a success story. And in this case of the e-commerce store, it allowed me to continue a few more years and I would have been able to without the automation. At the end, it was still too much. Uh, and uh, so it's not exactly a success story. It got me in the hospital, but it uh, uh, without the automation, it would all fail to get away quicker. What actually is fun right now and exciting for the future is I, I have now so, I thought I have hundreds of automations. And what I'm finding is each one of them saves money because I'm very practical in my automations. I'm not very theoretical. I'm not building something grand or something for fun. There's always something saving time or money. And they can also, small automations. I think that's a really great takeaway, especially if you're beginning and it's super overwhelming, a small, uh, maybe it's a later uh, uh, question, but uh, a small uh, automation can really have an impact. So what I'm now thinking, especially with the bloggers world, I see many bloggers struggling because if you have an e-commerce and you have a warehouse, you very quickly hire people and they can help you with other things. You need people to pack and all that. In blogging, pretty much all of us are alone. Um, so, um, and many go the VA route, but there's also limitations to that or too costly. And I see so many automations possibility. And this is a community that is not very much aware of that. Um, so I, I now am in groups and I see now possibilities there to maybe package up some of my automations, help other people and bring in some revenue for myself. Um, so yeah, that's pretty exciting. Thank you. Um, how do you stay updated with the latest trends and best practices in automation? Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not. Um, I just do my thing, um, but uh, and, uh, I'm in the course, so I get updates there. Um, and if there's one channel uh, I learn stuff is YouTube, but I kind of need to have a 
So that would be my place to go to so learn about the new chat TPT version and what I can do or see an exam. That's usually what I do. I hear something, I think, oh, interesting. I go to see if I can find a YouTube video about it to give an example so it can, it can be brought to life. But to say I'm really like on newsletters or no. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two more questions and then we're done. Thank you very much for your time. What advice would you give? You already said that before a little bit, but what advice would you give to someone just starting their journey in automation? Keep it small. Keep it small. Um, nothing is more frustrating and gives you more stress than wanting to bite off more than you can chew. And I, I mean, also in your group now for, I think, three years most of my journey is inside of your group and I keep seeing it happening. In the beginning, people come with very big questions and there are two people, uh, groups of people, some of them get overwhelmed and they quit and it's such a shame when they do because there's so much potential because it's actually a negative if you're solving a big automation because you don't understand what you just did um, and or it gets you very overwhelmed and stressed out and uh, other people manage to really fight through it and they get to the other end, but with a lot of stress and a lot of difficulty. So yeah, it's super difficult to be patient, but that is the advice I would give. Really like take what you learn, see if you can implement, uh, you can apply it to something because you, like I said, a small, op a small automation can already have a big impact. If you know how to bring something from um, Gmail and have, AI or a keyword, look for certain stuff and then save a file or send you a message or uh, archive it, then you already have a major win. If you know how to get information from, let's say you're in a Slack channel on work and you want to, you wish you would have it in a spreadsheet. If you know how to do that, there you can make really big steps and really small automation very quickly and focus on that and then really uh, believe that you will learn more and see more opportunity. And I learned it the hard way because I went the stress route. I cannot I cannot even count the number of times I also asked things that even the answer went above my head and it's just not fun. And now I get the same answer and I'm thinking, oh yeah, sure, and I do it, but it took time. So that would be my main advice. Keep it small, keep it very practical. It also keeps it fun. Don't go with a big project immediately because it's uh, it's just not fun. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You're also not learning like uh, calculating no. whatever at school first. You're first learning the numbers and the letters. And do the homework. If you are <laughs> in a group or whatever you do and there's an exercise at the end or a exam or a challenge or it can be in a paid group, it can be somewhere else, but do it because you really like make themselves also have small courses. I'm not the biggest fan, but you still learn and they also give you exercises and um um, that is where you learn. That's super, that's up to where you learn. That's what I learned. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a good advice. Yeah. Um, what's next for you in your automation journey? Are there any projects or goals you're excited about? Yes. So I'm excited about packaging up things I already have. And I actually think I can utilize AI much more than I'm doing so far. And that's my, that's where my focus is going to be. So I really want to see where I can push that boundary from robot to human uh, and see if I can maybe get one or more steps off from the human part of the task, especially with the example I gave earlier with the intervention option, to have it do all the prep and just ask me if it did it right or not. And all the times it did it right, I don't have to do it. I just have to do the ones that are wrong. So that is where I get excited right now to see how I can implement it. Especially now ChatGPT, the API became cheaper with ChatGPT4 because I was running into pretty high. I was the only person that was able to rack up bills for OpenAI. Everybody says, oh, it's just cents. It doesn't cost anything. <laughs> well, I don't know what I did, but I got bills for like 60, 70, $80 a month for the AI API, but I got really big prompts. So uh, now it became cheaper and I know how to be more efficient. I think, yeah, there's a whole new world there. Yes, the AI world. We're all exploring that. And definitely like AI and automation, the combination is so powerful. It's insane. Yeah. And we still haven't yeah. explored the full potential yet. So no. there's still a lot to discover. And With that's very images, exciting. Images recognition. There was this one I, I want to share. I thought it was amazing. This this insurance company that was able from uh, damages photos could, could make a decision about how, how uh, costly the damage would be. But it could also to 
to find the customer data, the, it just read the license plate out of the photo. It can be that simple. But what if you don't have an employee that needs to type it out? And they can make errors typing. So, um, yeah, there's so much there. I had text that I uh, had in a PDF that it would translate that I didn't have, that I was not able to select or not in PDF in an image, in a photo file. No problem anymore. And if you put those in, if you get those uh, regularly and you put them in an automation, wow. Yeah, super cool stuff. That is right. All right, Gary, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope this um, answers the story, inspires someone else uh, to start with automation or get more advanced on automation. Of course, we have our own course. You can get fi uh, can find more information about that yes. in the description um, if you want to learn about that. And also, Gary, what do you actually do? This is now your stage. What do you do and where can people find you? So my main business right now, Hidden Holland. So the website's hiddenholland.com. Um, and there is a different, there's an easy contact button. So that's where you can find me. Um, if you have an automation question, just ask me there. That's probably the most easiest one. If you also run a blog and you think, okay, I'm super overwhelmed. I'd love to get to know you. And because there are ways, this is not only for nerds and this is not only for um, consultancy businesses. There are so you can use automations literally i i did the e-commerce and i do it in blogging um there's no need for all that overwhelm so yeah please get in touch um yeah and that's where i am um and um i'm in the group so if you join the course you can meet me there um i'm always in the in the uh, in the forums and always in the uh, in the chats all right maybe two two sentences or one sentence about your blog what, what is the topic of it is there something that's all might also be oh, relevant yeah. sorry i'm not even thinking about uh, talking about me um, um uh, my topic is uh, people visiting the netherlands so when you come to, to amsterdam to holland what i want to try to achieve what i'm doing and i want to give you a better experience than you would have if you just land and and go at it and go beyond the guidebooks so, yeah, I know we want to see all the classics and you should definitely do, but there's usually a better way of doing it. And that is all what I'm trying to achieve within Holland. So you're the expert guy that everyone needs whenever they come to Holland because they can explore so much more. There's so much more to it than just like going to Amsterdam. I hope so. It's for me the most exciting thing to share that. And when I got into the hospital last year and it was super serious and I wasn't even sure how I was going to be able to get out. And you hear always those stories, those are life changing. I can only say that is true. And when I got out, I was done being stressed out over a parcel uh, and, and a package and um, nobody would ever miss me if I would stop it. And this is something that gets me excited, passionate, you know, it puts a smile on my face and also on the people that I interact with. And that for me is just so much fun. Uh, so yes, I love to share those th that knowledge and travel and, um, and make a trip better. That's the goal. Nice. So whenever you want to get in touch with Garrett, go to hiddenholland.com. I will also put all information in the description below so you can reach out to him and then meet him for your next trip to Holland. So that's very exciting. There Thank you go. much for your time, Gail. And um, we see each other in the next Q&A call. <laughs> yeah, we see each other <laughs> in the next Q&A call.